When designing programs to relieve poverty and increase resilience, development planners often have to choose from any number of possibilities without clear evidence to decide which will be most effective. Household Economy Analysis, or HEA, provides an evidence-based solution to this problem because it can predict and quantify how a project is likely to affect a household's total livelihood, what they produce and consume, earn and spend across a whole year. This means we can easily compare the effects of a wide range of projects while still in the early planning phase. Let's consider an organisation that wants to support household livelihoods and increase their resilience. How can HEA help to develop the most effective project? We'll divide the process into four steps. The first step is to carry out an HEA baseline. The baseline research takes place in this livelihood zone where the organisation wants to implement its project. It generates a detailed understanding of a household's total food, cash income and expenditure over a full 12-month period. We produce a quantitative picture of a typical household in each of the four different wealth groups – very poor, poor, middle and better off. This is covered in more detail in our previous animation. The second step is to produce a short list of possible interventions. The baseline shows that rice production and goat sales contribute significantly to the total income of households in three of the four wealth groups. The poorer two groups also rely on doing paid labour. All groups have a range of different expenditures. Note especially that very poor and poor households spend a large proportion of their available cash on staple foods. In this example, the organisation decides it wants to target poor households, which make up 40% of all households in the zone. The baseline information helps the organisation to shortlist interventions that would be relevant to these poor households. A rice intensification project, a project to support goat trading, and a market intervention to reduce the price of staple food. These activities aim to improve income and expenditure markets that are already important in the local economy. The organisation also wants to consider a project to cultivate flowers for sale on local markets. This would be a new activity in the area intended to diversify livelihoods. We can now model the impact of each of the shortlisted interventions on household livelihoods. This is the third step. The goal here is to produce business plans to show how much a household could realistically earn or lose from taking part in each project and then to integrate these earnings or losses with the HEA baseline data. Let's look at the flower growing project. This is the baseline total income and minimum annual expenditure of a poor household not benefiting from any project. A poor household taking part in the project will receive extra income which includes a startup loan and cash earned from selling flowers. But there is also an opportunity cost. Two household members have to devote a total of 150 days to working on the project, meaning they cannot earn money from local labour during those days. There are also expenses required to take part. Households must spend cash on setup costs and inputs, such as fertilisers. We can then work out the average annual net income of a household benefiting from the project and compare this to the net income of a household with no project at all. In this case, growing flowers would more than double a poor household's annual net income. We perform the same analysis for each project. The rice and goat projects increase income from these sources respectively as well as necessitating additional expenditure, for example, on the water needed to irrigate the extra rice. The staple food project works differently. It doesn't affect household income, but instead involves supporting traders to improve the rice supply chain. This reduces the rice price, which means that households don't need to spend as much on staple food. In other words, by decreasing household expenditure, the project increases net income. We can now compare the effects of all the projects on a poor household's average annual net income. We see that goat trading and flowers would offer the largest increases. However, this isn't the whole story. So far we've only considered a normal year, whereas the real measure of a resilience project is how much it helps households to cope in bad years when they are faced by shocks such as a drought, floods and market closures. This is especially true in a time of climate change. So the fourth step is to model how effectively each project would buffer poor households against the effects of a shock. In the project area, the main problem is drought, which occurs severely about once every five years. Here again is the total income and minimum necessary expenditure of a poor household not benefiting from any project. Let's model what happens in a drought. When we analyse the available data, we find that on average rice production falls by 40% during a drought reducing the household's total income. 
As a coping strategy, they can sustainably sell an extra goat to earn more cash. On the expenditure side, staple food prices increase significantly during a drought, meaning that the household has to spend a good deal more just to meet its minimum expenditure needs. In a drought year, the household's total income is less than their minimum necessary expenditure. In other words, households would face a deficit which we can quantify in food or cash terms. Let's now see if any of the projects would fill this deficit. First up, rice intensification. This helps the household to produce more rice, meaning that in a drought year they have more both to consume and sell than they would with no project. But the cost of water for irrigation also rises in a drought, which entails increased expenditure. Ultimately, we can see that the project reduces the deficit, but does not eliminate it. The goat trading project doesn't help with the rice losses, but it does mean that households can sustainably sell more goats. The income from this eliminates the deficit with some cash to spare. The staple food project doesn't help on the income side, but reduces the effects of the food price rises on expenditure and thereby also eliminates the deficit. Lastly, the flower project. This was the best performer in a normal year, but in a drought year 70% of the flowers are destroyed, seriously reducing what a household can earn. At the same time, the household members working in the flower fields earn less cash from other local labour, and on the expenditure side, they still have to spend money on increasingly expensive inputs as well as being affected by the food price rises. So while it is the best project in a normal year, the flower project is actually the worst of all options in a drought year, even compared to not having a project at all. It's now easy to rule out the two projects which would leave households with a deficit in a drought. Either of the other projects would be viable. Ultimately, the organisation decides to go with the goat trading because it fits with their expertise. However, they also decide to use the results from the modelling to advocate the government to improve the efficiency of the staple food market. This sort of analysis is crucial if we are to design projects which will actually increase people's resilience and avoid doing them harm. We've seen that HEA provides an evidence-based and defensible approach to resilience programme planning, and it need not be costly, because there are around 400 HEA baselines worldwide, all freely available and set up for such analysis. HEA, linking the reality of poor households to better decision-making.